Hello, and welcome to Reflections. I'm Rom Gaioso, your host. We are broadcasting via Futures Television, the home of the future on television. If you're listening to the show via podcast or watching us on TV, you too can be part of the conversation. Just visit our YouTube channel, that is IMCI Magazine, where we continue to chat about the topics of the day. You can also access this information on our website, that is www.futurestelevision.com. So don't be shy. Today, our topic is the upcoming ICI conference. It is filled with some great content. You can't miss it. My guests today are Arthur Weiss from AWARE and Heine Michaeli from the Institute of Competitive Intelligence, ICI, in Frankfurt. I will say a few words about the conference and then I'll introduce the guests. So uh, let's get going. All righty. The ICI conference is a little bit different. It takes place over time, and that allows several opportunities for us to interact with participants. They have a virtual reception, and I really loved the breakout rooms. We really did get to know each other. This time, we're looking at five live sessions, April the 8th, April the 13th, April 28th, May 13th, and May the 31st. From each day, I picked one item to highlight, so you have an idea what to expect. On April the 8th, Arthur Weiss, our guest today, will lead a panel discussion on competitive and market intelligence analytical tools. The title is Beyond Portering Analysis, and we will have an opportunity to ask him a few questions about the session later on in the show. On April the 13th, the discussion is Smart Tools for Effective, Competitive, and Market Intelligence. We will hear a discussion on smart tools. Can we automate some of the repetitive functions we do? Yes, no, maybe. So let's hear from our peers what they have to say about that. On April the 28th, one of the discussions is market models and their visualization via dashboard. That is Marcus Ott's keynote. On the ICI events, every time we have a discussion or a brainstorm session, the facilitator uses Mira, a fantastic visualization tool. I felt it did wonders to increase participation and the exchange of ideas. So let's hear about other dashboards out there. On May the 13th, we'll hear from Jonathan Gordon, Frank Matteau, and Patrick from Glassow on best practices in competitive and market intelligence research. Actually, Arthur Weiss had a great presentation on Google search. I highly recommend it. So from Arthur's LinkedIn profile, you can see the link to the presentation. Check it out. It's worth it. On May the 31st, the topic is analysis of competing hypotheses. Heine Michaeli, our guest today, will facilitate that session, along with General Naraj Bali and Ursula Toybert. Well, this is just a teaser. So you have a flavor for this wonderful conference. Don't miss it. Well, let me say a few words about our first guest, Heine Michaeli. So he's the director at the Institute of Competitive Intelligence in Frankfurt. He actually organizes the conference and leads the ICI. He is the general manager at the Denk Fabrique, an author, keynote speaker, and a lecturer at the Technische Hochschule Mittelhessen. So uh, let's actually welcome him to the show. Hello, Reiner. Welcome Hello. to the show. Hello, Rom, and thank you very much for inviting me to your wonderful show. Thank you so much for being here. It's always uh, wonderful to uh, speak with you. So I hope I did not, did not do too bad of a job at the introduction. 
Uh, but not please. at all. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect. Thank you very much. If I miss anything important, could you say a few words about yourself? Uh, yeah. First of all, so my name, Rainer Michele, who actually pronounced my German name pretty well already. Uh, yeah, I'm a CI practitioner for more than 30 years by now. And I'm a lecturer, as you correctly indicated, at universities, as well as with my own Institute for Competitive Intelligence. That's a post-grad institution, i.e. for those who already have a first degree and then want to learn about the very competitive slash market intelligence trade that's designed for those practitioners who already work. Typically, their employer sent them as delegates to our trainings, to our workshops. And then we provide certification, including a degree, a university degree, as we are accredited in Germany with a university. So that's in short my background and already introducing a bit about the Institute for Competitive Intelligence. And thank you again. One of our activities beyond the very workshops, training is indeed conferencing. So this is now our conference number 18 coming up. So as you can imagine, we have already a bit of an experience and learned over the year what it takes and uh, how we can evolve a little bit when it comes to conferencing. Now everything is remote. Yep, that's of course a COVID thing. So we have to definitely, we had to change a little bit from our format, as you can imagine. And by now we feel that remote conferencing is actually not just inferior. Now it simply opens a different way of yeah, socializing, networking, exchange of what we do in the field, best practice sharing, you name it. So it's all possible. It's a bit different, agreed. And of course, it's not like standing in the evening at a nice bar and chat over the whole day. But yeah, it can be done. And it's definitely, for those who never experienced that, quite surprising to see what's possible with this remote setting. So, Rom, thank you very much for introducing our conference. It's a complete journey, as you indicate, for all these days. Each day is designed with a different focus and a different format. So it's not just Zooming. We're using Zoom for this very conference, but we're using a barcamp format for the research day, including Miro, our whiteboarding tool. We're using panels. That's Arthur's session. You mentioned that initially. We're using a format where we go to breakout rooms and then some practitioners can introduce their favorite tools. That's the second session that you mentioned. And yes, we're having a kind of traditional day with best practice presentations. And you picked one title of that already, where we simply can join and listen practitioners willing to stand up, willing to propose in a way that they get some feedback from the audience. And again, this is learning. This is the kind of interaction that most practitioners seek, want. And yeah, they'll find it over here. And yeah, final day, if I just may add this one, uh, you mentioned already a challenge with the ACH, analysis of competing hypotheses. That's again a different format. So here we're doing a bit more like a university session. A case study will be distributed to participants. And then they can crack a nut and really try to solve a riddle kind of what's going on question. Well, that's the fun that's, part of it. That's, as you can imagine, always a bit of a <laughs> challenge. And of course, those who are very ambitious want to be, yeah. In yeah, the so the, you have a beautiful vision for uh, the ICI. It's so it, it is fun, it's entertaining, it educates, it enlightens, and, and it's really great to participate and, and just meet with so many you know peers out there and learn about their research. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the Spring Conference, right? So first of all, uh, I really love the formats. Instead of one never-ending day of presentation after presentation after presentation, where we really 
after a while you don't know what's really going on you can't retain or no one can possibly retain right so you spread this content over several days so we have the opportunity to digest the topics so do you see an advantage of this spread out conference model versus trying to pack everything into a single day oh yeah i, I think you sort of stressed the point already it's far more relaxed it's not the kind of full day attention and then you're pretty much exhausted in the end and you can't even remember what the name of your last session speaker was no that's why we are into this flow rather than an individual event every now and then so this by the way opens new opportunities as in we of course tape our sessions as well and even if you should miss one event you can still check out the recorded version so that's another big advantage given time zone, given commitment to work place that obviously you're not just losing everything if you are not available at a specific date. And yes, we have a knowledge sharing or learning platform under Moodle. That's another software tool where all our conference participants can chat, can use a forum, can interact can visit their respective profiles. So that's a bit like a virtual uh, socializing and networking tool. And again, it's open for the whole conference. So people get something out of that beyond just having a ticket and a yes, I can listen to some speakers. OK, so I wanted to go back to the um, highlights of the conference. I, I tried to pick one for, from each day, but did I miss anything important? What else would you like to highlight about the conference? I think you, you pretty much uh, reflected on all these in total uh, events that we lined up. Again, it's always a bit of a difference as in format, as in the way we interact. Whenever we have a main event, the sort of core of a day before, and after we're doing our breakout sessions for group discussion, literally. So you introduce to new guys, new faces, not just the kind of uh, usual suspect that you might have met before. Though it's very easy to sort of get in touch with somebody who's as new as you might be at our conference. And this adds again to this notion of it's more than just sitting there and listening to a presentation. It's really for people who want to become inter active and contribute to a group a community of people so there is something in for almost everybody i guess and yeah thanks from you you introduced all the days already and uh, i am uh, very pleased that you like it yeah these uh, conferences is always so much fun because uh, actually you know uh, we get to meet people the, the breakout mm -hmm. rooms the sessions the interactive sessions so and and i really like the fact that you do not try to just pack everything into a single day it's like a, it's not a marathon so it's really a fun experience where you, we learn and we actually have an opportunity to interact and exchange thoughts and ideas so it really does increase retention by uh, by quite a bit uh, so I want to ask you about the session you're facilitating on uh, April the 13th. So smart tools for effective competitive intelligence. Do you have a favorite tool you would like to share? Oh, what's your favorite child? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a very open question. That's a format we literally invented last time around. So we had a session already. And then we had nine tools. Tools are something as in software, but it could be a website, could be a service as well. And here the idea is that, yeah, practitioners like all of us are willing to share and present their favorite tools, not as in a vendor presentation where you try to sell the tool or try to sell a service. Now it's more for those sort of who really want to learn from others. How do you do specific tasks? And this could be a broad range. So in the beginning of the session, we have a pitch round. All of those who volunteered and are keen to present their favorite tools will give a quick pitch on what they want to present. And then boom, they go into breakout rooms and everybody from the audience can visit any breakout room. So, and then we're having group discussions in these rooms and more presentations, in-depth presentations, and a lot of question and answer. How to use it, how to get into this kind of 
advantage tool by tool. And again, the sort of variation of tools is, it's, if I give uh, quite just some examples from uh, last session, from this session, it could be the kind of graphical visualization of relationship tool, network analysis, social networks, as well as industry networks analysis. It could be a tool like a database, a trade related database, as in the kind of custom documents are used by some companies and commercialized, obviously sold in databases, as in who exports, imports, what kind of goodies by code, by volume, sometimes even by price. And we had a presentation about how can you find out what your competitor might be shipping, might be exporting or importing, or what is the market like, dynamics, trends, and stuff like that, which again comes to a surprise or for, as a surprise for some people who are not used to that. Uh, this time, upcoming conference, we'll talk about a wiki solution. Wiki as a knowledge management it looks a bit like or sounds a bit like an old fashioned stuff. But then again, if you have a community in your company, maybe a mid sized company where you don't have a lot of resources for other soft tools, then it's very straightforward, smart wiki might do a big job in capturing knowledge and processing knowledge and getting analysis disseminated to those who are interested. And again, we'll have one guy who will introduce his wiki and how he went into this kind of uh, project of implementing it. We'll be talking about a lady, a journalist background, who uses smart software when working with Chinese websites. As you might know, there's a bit of a language issue here. Yep. And there are some smart ways of being, well, good at reading, understanding, and uh, compromising the kind of uh, knowledge from Chinese websites. Another tool that will be introduced. So what, what, I, what I really like about the conference is we are not talking about esoteric or theoretical stuff. It's really mm -hmm. hands-on stuff that I can pick and use in my daily job today. It's not some well uh, esoteric discussion, really hands-on discussion. Uh, we evaluate software, you discuss the pros and the cons and the good and the bad and the ugly, because there's certainly ugly in there. But that that's uh, what I feel is amazing. And I, I really like the fact that you put a lot of effort into technology and how can we leverage technology to do a better job, you know? Thank you, yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. So we're very much hands on. And this is typically the kind of feedback that we get from our participants and, of course, those uh, students joining our programs. And that's how we want to be measured, whether you can use what you learn later on in your day to day operation. So it's both theory, conceptual stuff, as well as how to application of what we train and teach. That's the real benefit. I mean, how to use it and whether or not it's worth it and hearing from peers, you know, unfiltered. So we realize, well, you know, that's a good investment. That's perhaps not a good investment. That's that's a good fit for me. That's not a good fit for my organization and things like that. Uh, so I wanted to change subjects a little bit. And uh, I really want to ask you about the session you are leading on May the 31st. So we certainly swim in a notion of information, right? And at times, uh, making decisions can be a little bit challenging. So how can analysis of competitive hypotheses help us make a better decision? Oh, it's, a, it's a good question, because as you indicate, it's a very common yeah, end point when we do our research projects. We're ending up with, well, it could be this or it could be that. We have competing hypotheses. And it's very rarely that there's just one option that presents itself as the kind of, oh, this is what happened. This is what my competitor will do. This is what the market will be all about. So all the time we're having this issue of uh, uncertainty, but we need to make decisions. So we have to come to a conclusion, which is the challenge, yeah, which is quite challenging, but is, I would argue, rewarding as well. And here we go, the analysis of competing hypothesis frame, which is an eight step process, is a proven uh, way of getting from this uncertainty status where we simply don't know what we actually found, how to use it, 
to the kind of well the winner is and this is like it or not our hypothesis that is by definition by the very way that we, we, we uh, use this very process that's the kind of uh, consistent with what we found as in fact as an evidence and it's likely most likely from those remaining hypotheses that we couldn't reject based on evidence and, and facts that we found so in the end we have a log logical construct a bit like a shallow combs who's been the murderer based on who's not the murderer and who's left over might be the murderer so this is the kind of deduction that we're always using to come to a conclusion and then you have a winner a winning hypothesis and you can yeah throw in say your hypothesis to predict what to expect if this was true and then open your eyes watch out if you can observe what you predicted chances are you picked the right one if not back to square one and start it all over because something must have been wrong in your process so this very mode of operation like an ongoing process is very useful very much streamlining a process that otherwise might be a bit dodgy and of course in the end it's all about being professional enough to come up with the right conclusions so that's why we all love it i guess and we will use one case study and people participants can try it out literally and then compare results obviously with other participants because then the real learning starts and we can yeah, not only learn about the actual case but about the process of how we arrive to our conclusions so a fun part you have to unmute that's real learning and that's exactly uh, what i like about the conferences is that you have the opportunity to interact, to learn, to test it out, to see what you think, compare your results. And, and that's where I believe real learning takes place. So uh, for people who are watching us for the first time and they just uh, got to meet you and learn about the ICI, the upcoming conference. So uh, what else should they expect? What kind of benefit uh, will they have uh, when they attend the conference? Uh, well, I can try to add something as well. I think we mentioned quite a few benefits already, but agreed. Um, I think it's the notion of networking, even if it's a remote conference and you can't really exchange good old business cards while standing at the bar at the reception. No, but it's simply you will run into people and over this period of uh, events, of course, you get used to people. And of course, you can start writing emails, contacting, picking up the phones. So there's no need to limit yourself when it comes to socializing, networking, to just this one direction communication as in a traditional online conference kind of webinar, which is indeed pretty boring. Uh, I learned from other people as a feedback that they were quite surprised how well we implemented our Miro whiteboarding tool in the session. So they got some inspiration for their own work. Why wouldn't they do it in their own companies if it's possible with a bunch of kind of uh, not familiar people to work with a tool like that, to generate ideas, to discuss topics, to come again to conclusions about processes or best practices so that might be learning beyond the competitive intelligence market intelligence notion just as in how can we organize remote meetings work group meetings so we're having bar camp as one format for research which is pretty tricky to have a bunch of well several dozens of people who are not familiar with each other to discuss pretty openly here the case uh, the very um, day will be about finding resources identification of of good social media websites and of course how to validate information that you might pick up in these channels so here we go this is a give and take if everybody gives something they will get a lot of, of learnings away from that 
And again, it's an interesting bar camp format, hopefully inspiring people to use such a format in their own companies and benefiting from that as well. So this is pretty much what I would call sort of beyond the actual direct exchange of best practice case studies and then yeah, getting a lot of inspiration and ideas from our panels, software battle and these uh, um, case challenges that there's something hopefully to be picked up beyond the pure direct learning idea. All right. Well, I am actually a fan and I think you guys did such a beautiful job. And, and we don't talk much about in the use of technology, but you certainly do. And I was exposed to Miro before, but it wasn't as much fun. But when I got to the session with you, that yeah. was so much fun. And the way in which we basically work and play at the same time. So you made work seem fun. I and mean, it was actually um, a lot of fun. Thank you. Well, all right. So this is uh, looking so amazingly interesting. Uh, folks, this is just a small taste of what is in store for the ICI conference. So don't miss it. I will add a link on the website to the conference so you will be able to very easily find it online. So again, uh, Rainer, thank you so very much. Uh, please stay around. Uh, I will invite Arthur Weiss to the talk and we'll talk a little bit with him and then uh, we'll bring you back again. Uh, for some final thoughts. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Okay, wonderful. So uh, let's, let's start talking a little bit about um, Arthur Weiss. Let me see a few words about him before I actually welcome him proper uh, to the show. He's the Managing Director at AWARE in the United Kingdom, author of several wonderful articles, keynote speaker, lecturer, he has a standing column at the IMCI magazine. I really love uh, reading his articles. And I can't wait to read his column on this next issue. So he always brings a variety of interesting topics uh, to the table. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, welcome him. Hi, Arthur. How are you doing today? Hello. Hi. So great to see you, uh, as always. Uh, wonderful to speak with you. Okay, and you too. Wonderful. Um, even though it's a different time zone and probably different weather conditions. Well, yes. <laughs> we're still during the winter here, so we're enjoying ourselves. Well, winter for us is uh, we have, not... We have with... spring with lots of gorgeous flowers coming out. Oh, beautiful. Uh, <laughs> for those who Come love change. English... change. <laughs> yes. Um, but for those people who love English... Um, now is the time for daffodils. And if you don't know daffodils, one of the best poems in the English language um, is by William Wordsworth, um, where he talks about daffodils and seeing fields and fields of daffodils. And that's what we're in at the moment. Oh, that's but beautiful. over to you. <laughs> well, right off the bat, uh, there is a war in continental Europe and Western companies have literally billions of pounds invested in Russia. And all of that can be seized overnight. Uh, companies are pulled out of that market, but their assets are still there. So what kind of scenario should we think of going forward? Um, will they ever come back? Um, of course, this is futures television, so I'm thinking in the future. And I think the answer is yes, but not straight away. And it depends on what happens with the leadership in Russia at the moment. Uh, business is business. Um, if people in Moscow want to get a Big Mac, why shouldn't they? Um, and they do want Big Macs, and they do want Apple computers and iPhones and things like that. On the other hand, pretending business as usual, and so continuing selling Big Macs and iPhones and so on, is going to just encourage um, the leadership that don't care at all, don't want it. Um, but what they do want is um, to annex a completely different sovereign country. And of course, the way they see the Ukraine is historical. They look at the Ukraine as historically part of Russia, uh, 
subset of Russia. And historically, they're correct. Until the 1990s, um, when the Soviet Union fell, um, Ukraine was a province of Russia, but has very rarely had its own independence. But they have it now. And the idea that the Russians and the Ukrainians are one people and the Ukrainians love the Russians, we can see that was a fault of intelligence. That's what the Russian intelligence people told their leaders. The leaders then went forward with an invasion which has been proven to be an absolute disaster for the Russians, um, not just in McDonald's and Apple pulling out and the, the sanctions, but also in the loss of lives. Um, if it's true, and of course there's a lot of propaganda and it's difficult to know quite how much is true. Um, the number of lives that have been lost on the Russian side, and of course we don't know how many on the Ukrainian side, but it's probably a lot more because of the civilians. But the number of Russians that have been, soldiers that have been killed apparently is more than they were killed um, when they took control of Afghanistan. And I think it was more than the Americans lost in Vietnam in the sort of same short period of time. So it's a disaster for the Russians. And until there is a regime change, and I think Biden has got it right there, even though it was a slip of the tongue, um, I don't see it safe for Western businesses to go back. But this is my personal opinion. I am not a political analyst. I'm not a geostrategist. There are people who can say a lot more than I can. I just watch, observe, and try and interpret. And that's part of uh, doing intelligence. So as an economist, when I look at this, so let's say you want to take something for yourself, right? But in this case, they're just destroying or leveling the country. So if you want to take it for yourself, but now you bomb even the freaking shopping malls, there's nothing left for people to conquer, right? It doesn't make much sense. <laughs> but you always, one of the things about intelligence is intelligence isn't uh, stuck in time. You have to look at the his history. So from, this is why I said from the Russian perspective, or from Putin's perspective and the Soviet perspective, so anyone who was an adult before the 1990s and grew up, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. And they still see it that way. And they have forgotten how the Ukrainians, even when they were part of the Soviet Union, will have seen the Russian leadership. Ask, ask any Ukrainian to get to speak about their grandparents' experience under Stalin. When there was the something called the Holodomor, with the thousands and thousands of, or millions of Ukrainians that were starved to death. It was a political act of starvation. And when people say, oh, that was ancient history, um, to put things in context from an American perspective, ask uh, people of color in America or in the 70s to talk about their grandparents and stories their grandparents would have told. Because there were people alive today whose grandparents were slaves. And we're not talking that long ago. And we're talking in this case of America, the 1860s. So the 1860s, there were people whose grandparents were born in the 1860s. This is not even 160s, 170 years ago. This is 70, 80 years ago. So it's much closer. And there's a hate, and people forget that. Yes, indeed. So, uh, and it's not ancient history, and we can't just, uh, just relag, you know, massacres and crimes against humanity to, well, it happened so long ago. No, no, it's still material. And I think we uh, kind of uh, have to uh, keep talking about that and reminding people mm. of the suffering and what happened there, because it may happen again if we forget it, right? The term never forget, never again. But one of the reasons that particularly interests me, and I've been thinking about it before the Ukraine war, um, the next article I want to write on IMCI magazine, um, it's not really going to touch on the Ukraine war. It's going to touch on the concept, on the idea of bias. And I've already written a, um, a couple of articles looking at bias. 
This one is focusing on one particular type of bias, and that's groupthink. And for competitive intelligence, that's crucial because in the world we are today, there is a tremendous amount of groupthink um, and tribal behavior. So people link to their tribes. And the way you put things across links to your tribe and it becomes a real issue that you have to challenge. And part of the role of intelligence people is to challenge the group think of their own company. But if you're doing primary research and you're speaking to people and you're speaking to people in a competitor company, do they have group think about what their competitors are doing, um, which might be wrong. So you have to challenge everything. If you look at social media and the way people look on social media, look at um, what happened in America with um, the last election. And there are still people who say the vote was stolen and that Trump was the winner. And they won't accept that it's wrong. And one of the reasons they won't accept it's wrong is because everybody they know, everybody they correspond with on Facebook or Instagram thinks in the same way. And if everyone thinks in the same way, it's very it difficult to challenge that. Yeah. So you've got the peer pressure of everyone thinking the same. You have the same with COVID. There are the anti-vax people who think that people who believe in that COVID's real is not a scandemic. Everyone they know thinks in the same way. And here we and have the expression plandemic. It's, it was planned yeah. somehow or the, it's, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. And part of the role of intelligence is to try and avoid bias. And there are all sorts of biases we're told to avoid. But I think in today's world, the bias of groupthink is so pervasive that if you don't do that, you, look, you miss things out. And I think several of the articles I've written recently, they might not have touched on this directly, but they're there. Um, you know, one of the threats a lot of companies have isn't just the competitors that are traditional, but the non-traditional competitors, so the activists that the 99 1% percenters um, that go smashing up buildings because, or smashing up um, companies because they own all the wealth. Why do they think that? Because all their friends think that. Actually, so it influences yeah, behavior. You about, about that. Uh, so on that uh, watching the watchers, you mentioned that so people going about smashing companies and targeting companies or companies that support an idea or come from a different place so uh, can you tell us a little bit about what is the importance why should we invest resources into quote watching the watchers um sun tzu many years ago um i think about the year 300 before Jesus, um, talked about knowing your enemy. And if you don't know your enemy, basically you're going to be dead. Um, if we see our enemy as the competitor who's doing exactly the same thing we're doing, then potentially we're in problems. Because we're living now, and this gets to the idea of Porterian analysis, we're living in an era, in an era of disruption where people are looking for alternatives, they're looking for blue oceans, they're looking at different ways of doing things. So from a competitor's perspective, the enemy is still other companies. But more and more, you need to understand fully your stakeholders, and your stakeholders don't all love you. And some of them really do not love you. Um, and if you don't know who is out to hurt you, then you're going to get hurt. Um, and if you look at companies that have got hurt recently, often it's not been the standard competitors. The ones that hit the news are the ones where a whistleblower has said what's happening or um, you've got um, a climate change group that has been mobilizing against you. So there are all sorts of groups now that 
don't like you and are trying to act against you. And you have to act to defend yourself. You have to be able to justify what you're doing, make sure you're squeaky clean, um, that you're not doing anything untoward, and uh, keep an eye on what they're doing because you don't want them to hurt you. And they're going to try and hurt you. Um, so what I'm saying is that um, the, oh, the idea that you only look at your competitors, possibly your customers, your suppliers, new entrants, and obviously you need to look at the business environment around you, but some of your competitors aren't actually other businesses. They're ones that want to bring you down because they don't like what you're doing. And we've had for a long time the campaign against the arms trade in Europe, um, mobilizing against arms companies. But now we have them against food companies. So you have radical um, vegans targeting farms and meat products. You have uh, companies targeting sort of for climate change areas. You have the anti-capitalists targeting the banks. And some of these people are quite violent. Yeah, and, and that's really important for us to think about uh, because this could be uh, not just uh, 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 some kind of a thought threat. It's a real threat. You know, people are intimidating others, are uh, uh, planting bombs, uh, uh, committing acts of violence or, or, uh, or attempting to. So it's something uh, for us to pay attention uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, the other article that you wrote, Seven Deadly Business Sins, because you talk about corporate behavior, right? So things that we do, and maybe we should rethink the way in which we do things. Can you say a few words? What were you thinking when you wrote uh, Seven Deadly Business Sins? Okay, that dates back many years. And I have to thank um, ben, Professor Ben Gilad, Dr. Ben Gilad, for that. Um, Several years ago, he gave a fabulous keynote presentation at, I think, a Skip London com conference, where he talked about what he called Gorish. Um, and Gorish means nothing. But that's what I was talking about. And I just changed it to seven, seven deadly business sins. And the idea is Ben Gilad's, but I think I've taken it forward in the sense of showing why it really is relevant to companies at all times. If you look at companies that are highly acquisitive, um, and my favorite example there is Hewlett Packard, if I'm allowed to mention them. Um, of course, Hewlett Packard, as it was a few years ago, doesn't exist. They've split themselves up into two and I've stopped monitoring them. So I can't say whether they're still as acquisitive but they're still in legal actions against a company called Autonomy. And they're suing Autonomy. Possibly Autonomy did play around with their finances. But the issue isn't whether Autonomy was wrong. The issue was how much due diligence did Hewlett Packard do? And what's come out of the court cases is basically for a a billion, a multi-billion dollar acquisition. They only did a few hours due diligence. Their finance director hardly even read the report from the their advisors. So they purchased a company because they wanted to purchase the company. They wouldn't do. They didn't do the research. They didn't gather the intelligence. It's called greed. It's like a child where you put lots of cream cakes on a table. Oh, I want, I want, I want, I want except in the case of a company, I want, I want, I want to buy the company. And it's pure greed. And that has implications and is a form of bias in the sense they're not thinking what they want to do. Um, and Hewlett, the purchase of autonomy was one massive write-down, but they also have done other write-downs. If you look um, at their record, um, some of you may remember there was a thing called the Palm Pilot, which was the the state-of-the-art um, handheld sort of smart device many, many years ago. And Hewlett-Packard bought it 
And within a year, they'd virtually killed it. They didn't know what they were buying. They just saw something that looked good and they bought it. Um, they did the same with EPS and they had a massive write down. So if you look at the acquisitions, they never really integrated the purchases into the company. If you look at their um, turnover, they made an acquisition, a massive acquisition, but it wasn't reflected in the bottom line. That's greed. Um, another one um, that I discussed was the idea of opinion. How often have you heard people say, it won't work here, or that's not the way we do things? And they don't stop to think, is that actually the case? Or is it my opinion? What you should be saying, and this is straight from Ben Gilad, is saying, under what circumstances could this work? Is there a way of making this thing work? And there have been lots and lots of inventions and lots and lots of ideas where people say it won't work and companies have rejected it and it's worked for somebody else. So what that article looks at is the seven sins, greed, opinion, routine. So, oh, this is the way we've always done something. Ego. Um, we see that in Ukraine. I think Putin's ego is stopping him from understanding what's really going on. Uh, he's not listening because he is right. That's ego. Success. Well, we've done it in the past. It worked in the past, similar to routine, but not quite the same. There's hope. Um, next year will be better. Next year, when COVID stops, we're going to rebuild our sales. Maybe you will, but if you haven't planned for it, and if you hadn't actually put in a process so that you will, you're talking about hope. You're not doing the intelligence because everybody else, if everybody else has, you've lost out. So you've got seven, seven failures. Every company has to have a belief in themselves. Every company has to be slightly greedy. It's the level. If that is your driving force, then you've got a problem. Um, it's like the real deadly sins. Um, if there was no lust in the world, there'd be no children. So you need a bit of lust, but not when it drives, it's your driving force. Yeah, I think yeah, that's I think the important thing is everything is in moderation, I guess. And when things are uh, out of balance, that's exactly when I think we get into a lot of trouble. Uh, so I wanted to change subjects a little bit, and I want to ask you about the session you are leading on the upcoming conference. So we keep coming back to Porter's Five Forces or the McKinsey Diamond or the augmented McKinsey's Diamond, tools created some 40, 50 years ago. Is it time for us to look beyond that? As you said, it's 40, 50 years ago. Um, I have here, let's see if I can see it, it's a telephone. It's also a camera and a computer and a machine for playing games and all sorts of things. Go back 50 years um, and you're not that... Well, if you think the moon landings, this is more powerful than the computers that landed people on the moon. And... Porter's model reflects a world where camera manufacturers were different from computer manufacturers, who were different from telephone manufacturers, who were different from um, t um, screen game manufacturers. I don't know if anyone remembers that tennis game called, I think it was um, Pong or Ping and Pac-Man and some of the classic old games, but they were different. Now they're all together, all on one device. And so the camera manufacturers have gone out of business. For that matter, there are phone manufacturers that essentially were at one stage the market leaders. Um, how many people own a Nokia phone now? But Nokia didn't really anticipate properly the smartphone revolution. So 
industries have converged. And if you look at the typical Porter analysis, when you talk about industry rivalry, when you were talking about industry rivalry in the old days, it was Nikon in Minolta and Olympus um, and Canon and possibly a couple of others. And that was your subset. Now you've got Apple and Samsung and Motorola and companies that were never camera manufacturers before. So your industry has changed radically. I'm not sure Porter's analysis really is up to some of these disruptive changes. And that is the key word, disruptive change. In an age of disruption, Porter analysis possibly needs to be changed slightly, or it's still relevant, but how you apply it and how you look at things may be less relevant. Um, and there are business models that have taken Porter's ideas and developed them f further. It's just they're not really taught to the same extent or known to the same extent. Um, I'll give one example. Um, and Porter himself wrote a footnote in one of his books saying this was one of the most important developments since um, his original um, uh, competitive strategy book. Um, uh, uh, Adam Brandenburg, uh, Barry Nelbuff um, and their book Cooperation and the idea of game theory um, for analyzing companies. So they've come up with a game theoretical model of uh, basically looking at competition. And they've got a, um, a thing called the value net, which is similar in some ways to the five forces model, but it's also very different in how you use it, how you apply it. And that's important because we keep maturing, we keep changing, and we have to you know, bring new tools along. You know, it's, we can't be stuck in the past somewhere. We just need to move on, right? Okay, so I wanted to ask, go back to that presentation you gave. Uh, it was uh, Google Beyond Search. Uh, what are some of the hidden search features we should pay attention to? That's kind of difficult because it's a moving target. Um, what, I mean, the workshop has finished. Um, I've got a recording. I'm actually thinking of editing the recording and marketing it but I have to decide whether it's going to be marketable um, um, or sort of, you know, the video and the, um, the recording. But the, when you're looking at any topic, you have to basically think why that information will be available and why you can't find it. Um, so, as one example, I have five different sorts of invisibility. Um, one type of invisibility, and probably the most common, um, is where you can't find something because it's not been search engine optimized to appear in the top 10 or top 20 lists on Google. So most people don't find it because they're doing a search which brings up search engine optimized sites and what they're looking for ain't search engine optimized. Um, so if you're looking for a white paper or a document that's been saved as an Adobe Acrobat file, so a PDF, you're not going to find it unless you're very lucky with the standard search. Just add in the search operator file type colon PDF, and you're only searching for PDFs. And by only searching for PDFs, you're more likely to find it. You've started to get around the search engine optimization. So learn the advanced search features of Google, and there are lots of them. Um, use them, and that's probably the easiest way of getting beyond the search optimization to something that will is more likely to give you what you're looking for. Um, so that's one. I said there were five types of invisibility. Um, another type of invisibility is something's in a database with a firewall attached to it or a paywall. Pay for information. Not everything is free. If you expect all the information you want for intelligence to be free, then you're going to be missing out stuff. But also know the databases that are free. Some of the patent databases are free. So look at those. If you're looking for patent information, there's Google patents. So there's a specialist Google sites that you can use. 
again, getting beyond the search engine optimization, um, then the stuff that is less likely to be indexed. Sometimes you can search for images. Um, and I believe the Bing image search, and for that, uh, there's another search engine used in Russia. It's a Russian search engine, but it's very, very good when we get back to Russia again, um, called Yandex. I'm, I'm not sure where it's based, but I think it's actually probably registered in the US as well. Um, it's designed for uh, Slavic languages, but it's got a brilliant search image function. Um, the other thing is to keep up to date. Um, just as an example, if you look at Google image search in the last, I think probably last month, um, on a mobile, there's been Google Lens for some time. That's now been integrated into uh, Google's image search. So if you bring up an image, you can zoom in on parts of that image and focus on just that bit and get slightly more than you would if you take the image as a whole. Um, it's not perfect. Sometimes what comes up when you zoom in, the answers are absolute nonsense. Um, I'll give an example of nonsense. Um, when I was testing it, I tested it on, I think it was eight well-known female politicians. And I wanted to zoom in on each face to find out, did Google recognize who that face was? And for some of them, no problems at all. Uh, Alexandra um, Ocasio-Cortez, it knew who she was straight away. It knew who Theresa May in the UK was straight away. But Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand, for some reason, it, um, the images that it gave were of the the lovely green scarf she was wearing, and it gave me shopping sites. Now, whether that's Google being sexist or just how the AI of this tool works and it focuses on this green scarf because that was noticeable, whereas the others were just faces, I don't know. But that's brand new. I didn't include that in my workshop because, as I said, it's brand new. And there are often brand new things that come up. Um, so it's keeping up to date and knowing what's there. And that's part of the work. Yeah, but it is available. So if people want to go to, uh, you know, Arthur Weiss's LinkedIn profile, you can see the presentations in there. And as always, you're sharing and uh, educating others. So thank you so much for uh, your sharing spirit. But not this one yet. Um, okay. This was um, on LinkedIn. It was just how you could book for it. But... Um... Unfortunately, it's gone for now. We'll but be back. I do regularly, um, getting back to Raina Michele and ICI, um, I do a regular workshop um, at least once a year. But if you know there was enough people wanting it, it could be more than once a year, looking at um, how to find information uh, online through regular search tools and through social media. So if you really want to learn in depth how to search online for open source intelligence, go on to um, Institute of Competitive Int for Intelligence website and click and book and you'll get everything and you'll get much more than I did in this sort of two hour workshop because this is an eight hour workshop and there's a lot more that can be covered. Wonderful. So actually, let's uh, bring Brander back and uh, let's uh, have a three-way conversation. Good to have you back, Brander. You were listening to Arthur. Now, uh, I wanted to uh, pose uh, a different question. So, uh, yeah. well, uh, we're all excited. Uh, uh, we're just around the corner from the conference. Uh, what are your final thoughts on the conference, actually, to both of you, Arthur and, uh, and Rainer? What are your final thoughts? What is that you're expecting the most? Uh, and what should we be expecting about the conference? <laughs> well, again, on sort of on a personal level, to be honest, um, I'm very much looking forward because it's always a bit like a family reunion. So you run into so many people where you've met before, where you wanted to update. So it's not just business, not, not just the kind of pure, serious business, but it's a bit like a family reunion. And mm -hmm. many of our alumni, so students, participants of our workshops stop by and say hello and what happened in the bean and this kind of uh, yeah socializing on top. 
I, I, I mean, now that we're sort of talking about also what you mentioned with the 50-year uh, cycle of how the world has changed, I remember in 2020 when we started this remote conferencing, my first session on the first sort of keynote day was before that introducing Zoom and how could you change your view and do you know all the little gimmicks when you click here, click there, and I really had to explain it and I thought we have to explain it because nobody was used to using a zoom or any let's say telco software in these days and that's only two years ago and by now come on everybody knows everybody will find a way around so we don't even bother to introduce anything like that and that's two years and think about how much we have changed in our conferencing and of course the way people work think about home offices think about this kind of uh, different tasks when it comes to working with peers, group work, and how we used to do it, and now how openly we do it. So I think it's amazing to see that we are part of a process, and it's so fast. And now think about it: two years from now, how will we do conferencing? How will do? How will we do a session like the very session you're now doing with us? So looking forward to that. Really amazing exciting times we're living in now we, we're just talking about the conference but there's much more to the ICI than just a conference right so there are also the certificating the certification you know, courses and we can go back and there's more training can you say a few words about the certification oh we have uh, several certificates as we call it certificate programs so that's a kind of uh, in, in life workshops and of course, there is on top of that a kind of self-paced reading. That's a technical term for prepare yourself and go to some articles or books after you attended the class. So we have seven of them lined up from fundamental to research, to analysis, to management and to strategy. Plus, we have an executive one. So these are blocks, programs where you run through the life um, yeah, like an author's workshop, presentations and interaction. And then you're having with our Moodle learning environment a whole lot more, as I've said, forum, discussion groups, asynchronic communication with your peers and your faculty guys. And then we have assignments. So these are mini projects, which is quite a challenge. So then you have to apply what you learned. And that's exactly where the rubber meets the road or where you really learn, as some students sometimes tell me, because now you have to apply. And these two assignments, each of them a workload of 40 hours, so a work week in a way, are pretty tough, as in students have to tackle something with we, ICI assigns, or they can pick one of the two from their own company. So the kind of button draw project nobody ever had time to do or nobody had the knowledge of doing that and then of course it's in line with what your company needs and it's supervised it's coached and of course you're getting a lot of comments on that so people enjoy that because it's really the kind of application that maybe they never ever did before when they just attended a workshop and they just had a well, webinar like webcast session, but nobody bothered to really check out whether something was learned. And then the final, final bit for all certificate uh, candidates is an exam. So here again, we do written exams, closed books, online, obviously, where people have to show what they actually can apply. And that's the next level, as you can imagine, in terms of uh, yeah, evidence that they achieved something. And only then, if they passed all the assignments, which are graded as well, and to find the exam, then they get our stamp of approval and this very university certificate as a proof of what they learned. Wonderful. Well, I, I don't want any spoilers, but Arthur, I have to ask you the question. So I think you did such a marvelous job on that escape room challenge. So you're the only person who could actually make Morse code exciting. Are you preparing any kind of surprises for us on this conference? Um, 
not in this conference. Um, I mean, I've developed the escape room idea slightly more, and it's actually on my website, um, although it probably needs to be updated because some of the answers now are historical. They required research, and um, one of the questions is now slightly out of date, so I have to update it. But um, getting back to some of what Wayne was saying about um, conferences, um, I miss the interactive, the personal interaction. But when I go to a conference in person, I'm meeting the people I already know. I'm sitting down for lunch with the people I already know. Um, and unless somebody's introducing me, I don't really meet that many new people unless I really push myself out. I'm not the sort of person that finds it easy to push themselves out and really sort of work a room and get to know everybody. But the beauty about the Zoom conferences is there are breakout rooms where we have sort of these coffee trials or coffee breakout rooms where you're randomized with different people. And it's a great way of meeting different people, not in person, but you get to know them in a way you probably never get to know somebody in a normal live setting. So there's pros and cons for both. Um, I would hate to have a world where we lose that interactivity that you get, um, but I want both. The same applies with the workshops. Um, I miss the in-person aspect of a workshop, um, and I would set tasks where I could go round and see what people are doing as they're doing it and sort of give them hints if they're finding it getting stuck, which is difficult to do on Zoom. But on Zoom, or um, when you do an interactive workshop, when it's split into two halves instead of it being all day, and you said this before, it can be very, very tough having an all day workshop. You forget things. Um, when it's split into two or three halves or two or three parts, it's much easier for you to remember things and you can give homework in the middle, which you can give, let's say an hour, an hour and a half research project, which you'd never do in person because people won't do it. You know, or if you do, you're taking away from the training opportunities. So it's a way of adding um, learning opportunities that didn't exist before. So, we need to keep both, um, and it's how to do this hybridization. So when Rainer says in two years' time, what's going to be happening, hopefully we'll have cracked it. Um, and it might be on StreamYard or one of the other platforms that uh, may take over from Zoom. Nothing is forever. Even Google's not forever. Um, and I Meta. remember... Meta. <laughs> I remember before Google... So um, I started using the web, I think, 3BG. That's three before Google. Um, but Google started in 1998. Uh, most people didn't really start using it till about 2001. Um, you know, so I remember the long lost Alta Vista. In fact, I think I even remember when Alta Vista started. I was before Internet Explorer. And things changed. You have to move forward. You have to develop. You have to keep up um, and accept that the world is different in 2022 to what it was in 2019. Well, actually, we may learn that uh, uh, Meta is actually one of those big blunders because uh, when you talk about Meta or Met in Hebrew, it's death, right? So do you want to use the death search engine? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Like you had the Ford Pinto, now we have the, the Meta. No, no, we're not using that one. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, how wonderful to see you guys. And uh, I, I can vouch for the conference I met. And through the coffee breaks, I met so many wonderful people that I would otherwise, it's just as Arthur, uh, I wouldn't go around and talk to people. But because I was in a coffee break with someone, and, and, and that was Kai, Kai Gorlich, and we became good friends and we, we talked and we did shows together because of a coffee break. So, yes. uh, you know, and people say, well, the format of the conference, why should we talk about that? Because it matters. 
you know, because you may discover things, because you're trying, trying it out. Uh, what I love about the conference, it's not boring. I mean, seriously, I, I think of Eleanor Roosevelt, and she said, and many other people said after that, you know, tell me and I forget. Involve me and I learn. So there are many ways that the conference will involve us. We ex it's not just someone sitting in the high podium and telling you this is what you should do. No, it's real people with hands on the door, opportunities to discuss and interact and ask questions and to be challenged and to be exposed to new ways of thinking, to new tools, to new research methods. And I think that's really the wealth of the conference is this is such a beautiful learning environment. I really love it. <laughs> Thank and you. don't forget, we start <laughs> this Friday. So if you've not booked, make sure you book now. Um, and if you miss Friday or it doesn't turn you on, there's next week as well. And there's five sections. So go to the Institute of Competitive Intelligence website, um, conference.competitiveintelligence, conference.competitive-intelligence.com and sign up, and I want to see everybody watching this there. Yes, and by yes, the way, so we'll have a link uh, to the ICA conference on Features Television website, so you can go there and check it out. Actually, on Arthur Stocks, we actually have a, a link in there, so you can go in and watch his conference. Uh, I certainly will be there in his talk, and let's talk about uh, portrait analysis, among other things, and there's so, so much more. So I really wanted to, again, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me and the audience today. And I'm really looking forward uh, to the conference. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much for inviting us. Wonderful. So let's talk a little bit about uh, upcoming events. So in short, we're going to have Dr. Maria Hoffaker. He's an amazing podcaster from Berlin. Uh, our other shows, uh, one of them is In Focus, uh, in partnership with the World Future Studies Federation, or WFSF. And that one will focus on the implications of the war in Ukraine for Germany. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers, and it will be a great discussion. As promised, I will bring back Mark Cox, author of The Business Case for Love, and David Rimmer, who will talk to us about getting our startup straight. Uh, we will continue to focus on the topics you like the most, so namely technology, the metaverse, and sustainability. We will also talk about the upcoming Frost and Sullivan event, so don't miss it. By the way, feel free to continue to submit your comments and questions on our YouTube page. I will make sure to read it and present to the guests any other questions you may have. If you're listening to us via podcast or watching this show as a recording via Futures Television, you too can be part of the conversation. Again, just visit our YouTube channel and leave a comment. Please don't forget to share and like this video. And please do subscribe to our channel. I'm counting on you. So it's really time for us to um, start to say our goodbyes. Again, thank you so very much for your presence and participation in the show today. You can always reach out to the magazine or to me, the host, via Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. And I sincerely hope to see you soon in the ICI conference. Thanks again. Thank you, Arthur Weiss. Thank you, Rainer Michaeli. And I will leave you with our institutional message. Thank you. Thank you.